Well, hello, everybody, and welcome, a very warm welcome to our event today, where we're going to be exploring the brand new ISO standard 37000, which focuses on organisational governance. Now, as you know, here at APMG, we get to work with many, many thought leaders all around the world. And I'm delighted today to welcome two more people to that list. Let me begin with uh, Carolyn Chalmers. Carolyn is an internationally recognized figure in the world of governance and is an exemplary facilitator. She's been involved from the very beginning, I think, of the drafting of ISO 37000 and is one of the very few people who can provide the history behind and the intentions of every aspect of that standard. Carolyn also chairs the South African Bureau of Standards Technical Committee who are responsible for the standard in her country. So welcome, Caroline. great to meet you. Thank you so much, Nigel, great to be here. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Also joining us is Seamus Gillen. Seamus, um, his professional career began as a public servant working for an advising government here in the UK, including up to ministerial level. He moved on into industry and has held senior leadership positions in the utilities and in the telecom sectors before founding his own advisory firm, Value Alpha Limited. Seamus is just putting the finishing touches to a book, which will be published later this year called Building Better Boards. So welcome Seamus, great to meet you. Uh, thanks very much, Nick, for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Okay, excellent. So look, let's jump straight into it and start picking apart this whole concept of corporate governance and and so on and, and why we might have a standard. So Caroline, I might put that question to you first, if I may. I know that governance has been a theme for a long time now and people have been focusing on it in different ways and different countries. So why ISO 37000 and, and how has it come about now? Why now? Mm, thanks, Nick. Um, governance has been around for a long time. Uh, really since the sailing ships left Europe and we got that separation of the management in the countries and the, the shareholders and investors uh, in another country. So days and weeks of um, probably months of sailing around the world. And that's really where it started. But today inter it's international. We, we have no boundaries. The pandemic really put the last end to that. And everybody like today we're online um, and LinkedIn live so really the there is no boundaries b between um, how business happens um, today so governance flows equally across these boundaries so the need for an international standard has really it really is now and in fact it when we started in in 2016 when it was first um, thought of and agreed to by ISO um, it was ready then already. It took us a long time to build up the standard. Um, why ISO 37000? Well, it's the first international benchmark on corporate governance. Um, let me not say corporate governance, because actually it's for all sizes and types of organizations, no matter where, they, where they're founded or no matter their location. So ISO 37000 really is a standard for for every organization, for the governing bodies, for their stakeholders. Um, and it, and it's, the time is so right now because straight after the, as a result of the pandemic, as I said, is that these international boundaries have, have fallen away. Before we had uh, international standards, we had uh, the OECD, for example, but that was really focusing on getting governments ready to put governance um, standards in place, codes and reports in place in their countries. But this is the first time we've had an international standard for the governance of an organization. And it couldn't be at a better time because of this interna internationalization that we see today. Okay, I completely agree with that. I, I think, you know, in my own country, I've seen, you know, people wrestling with, you know, improving governance. So we've got, you know, local professional membership bodies and so on kind of doing their own thing. So it's really refreshing to know that like minded people have come together and, you know, kind of built an international standards for for the benefit of all, really. And um, Seamus, let me come kind of come to you next because we've been talking about governance and the the aim and the objective i suppose is always to improve and you know get better so in terms of you know good governance it's a fairly subjective term what does 
good governance mean in, in this context? Well, there's an interesting discussion to be had about good governance and best practice governance. Uh, and arguably, every organization is different. Every business model is unique. Uh, and so it's important to talk about good governance and then we take what is good and we make it best for our own business model. But in terms of good governance, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing fact that all boards fail for the same reason. All organizations fail for the same reason. And there are eternal principles associated with governance, which means that we can learn what good looks like, and then we can bring it back into our own organizational business model. For example, separating out power at the top of the organization between the chair and the CEO, having independent non-executive directors on the board, um, conducting independent external board evaluations periodically to, to check that the governance is still fit for purpose and fit for future. These are the kinds of features of good governance, which every organization, uh, irrespective of their business model, can in inherit. And, and the purpose of this training is to help individuals assess whether they have got good governance and what more they can do personally, professionally and organizationally to improve the governance, to get it to where they want it to be. That, that makes their business model work successfully. Okay, thank you. And I mean, how how do we really just kind of stick on that, Seamus? You know, how would you say it's possible to elevate that then to a truly global, you know, standard rather than something that just meets a you know local uh, business context? Well, as Carolyn said, and she was quite right, um, there are no international boundaries anymore, uh, and capital flows across boundaries, viruses flow across boundaries. But in terms of the work of organization and businesses, capital flows all around the world. And what we find when that happens is that regulation and regulators follow those capital flows around the world. And what happens next is that governance follows the regulation. And so we need to to realize and recognize and acknowledge that with these uh, flows across boundaries, across international markets, we need to put into place a standard which everybody understands. And we talk about this being no going back technology in a way. Investors and stakeholders all expect to be able to assess the performance of an organization whether it's in South Africa, whether it's in North America, Southeast Asia, or, or, or Europe. Uh, and the global standard is to provide the benchmark to allow those stakeholders, and particularly the investors, to be able to understand and compare uh, one organization with another and whether one organization is better than another in order to make their investment decisions. Mm, thank you very much indeed. I kind of puts a you know, very clear, um, if you like, a very clear view on why, you know, it's important to be able to look at this and kind of think about, you know, almost benchmarking really and see where are we as an organization and what's the delta between where we are and where, where we really need to be. Um, so, Carolyn, I, I, I guess, though, you know, working with senior people, the senior leadership, the C-suite often of, of organizations at the board level, um, people's time is often very constrained. You know, they're, they're, the, the demands on their time pulls them in lots of different directions. And um, uh, I imagine it's quite challenging to get enough time to help you know, um, board level people learn about these standards and embrace them and understand properly, you know, what they need to, to take on board. And um, uh, why then have, have you kind of developed a, a sort of a training course around this? And, you know, how is that going to address that, that very real problem? Thanks, Nigel. I think um, it's an age old uh, question to try and how do you educate um, the board and the board is 
is not unlike everybody else. We all need to continue to learn. If we don't learn, we're moving backwards, um, especially in today's rate of change. We have to keep on our toes. And when do we do that as a, as a director? When do we do that as part of a governing body? Um, so ideally, you'd want to have everybody together on the same page when you're governing so that everybody's got a firm foundation on which to stand. But we don't have the time or opportunity to do that as a collective. When we are together, we want to be governing. That's what we are paid, if we are paid, well, that's our time together. That's the purpose of it. So to be trained, why I developed this training um, together with Fluid Rock and Candle Governance is really to give boards the opportunity to have every board member um, go through this training on their own, in their own time, in a very confidential kind of environment. So there's no pressure. They can have a look at um, the, all the boards that they're sitting on. They can have a look at how the standard applies to them. They don't need to have to concentrate on, the, on reading the standard and, and do self-interpretation of what it means. So they're getting guidance in this training in terms of what the various words, for example, mean. And as, as an international standard, you can imagine that we've been discussing the very words that have gone in here. Um, so the very language that's being used has got international agreement. So there is a meaning behind it. And it's not just words on a page. So that understanding is, is very difficult to get when you're just reading it cold off a, off a sheet. And to get that understanding and then to apply it to the various boards that you're sitting on while you're going through the material is really what we try to do here. Is it's a self-study um, in your own time, own, uh, in your own pace, um, but with the idea that every board member does go through it so that there is this constant firm foundation for everyone. I, th I think you've made several really key points there. The first one is I think the higher up that you are in an organization, um, often the temptation is to take less structured training and that can be you know, a mistake. Um, uh, when people have put together and thought about structuring education, um, it's often the most efficient way to be able to learn something. Um, often senior people enjoy reading, they enjoy listening to podcasts, they enjoy, you know, a whole variety of different inputs. So unstructured learning is very common, I think, is one of the, you know, kind of most common uh, attributes, if you like, of uh, senior leaders. So they consume if a I lot can of interrupt. information. If I can interrupt, Nick, Please that's do. exactly what Please we do. have in the training is we've got videos. So every every bit of um, material has an introductory video that just gives that kind of background. So as you say, you know, we learn by multimedia these days. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. I'm definitely going to kind of check that out and um, from myself in my role and, and see how, you know, it can help me think a little differently about the work that I'm doing on a day to day basis. Um, Seamus, if I might come to you. So we go on the training course and we start consuming this content and so on. Tell me a little bit more about how that training works. And, and also, I suppose, what is that a step towards? What's the journey beyond the initial training course? Okay, well, let's say one thing that actually many directors don't bother to learn. It's not a case even of some directors catching up or staying on top of things. There is a very significant deficit uh, in terms of the uh, directors who serve on boards who are actually keeping up to speed with developments. Um, and governance is changing in, in a radical way. It, it used to be seen as a compliance tick box activity, whereas now it's recognized as a fundamental underpin to the successful achievement by the organization of its objectives. And what you find on boards is that there are directors who don't get governance and they stand in the way, they see it as compliance and tick box and they don't want to spend any time on it uh, and we need to work with them to help them understand that uh, governance is going to help them achieve their business objectives more effectively more efficiently it's going to make their organizations more successful and that is the way in which the the training has been structured um, to help people realize that this is something which is going to make their lives better 
make their world better, make their organizations better. And the, the great advantage of having this as a global standard is that it, it has international applicability. It means that a director can serve on a board in one country and also serve on a board in another country and bring the learnings from one jurisdiction to another. And that's a fantastic um, opportunity. Also for governors professionals, it allows for career enhancement. It's something that increasingly regulators and other uh, lawmakers will look for evidence of from directors and from governance professionals that they have pursued the standard and that they have been accredited uh, as, as a result of that. Uh, and that is, the, that is the big prize here, that we are at the beginning of a very exciting journey. Uh, and uh, this is what we want everyone to get involved in because it will soon become an indispensable condition of joining a board or looking after a board. I think you make a really super good point there because there's so much um, aspiration out there to you know, augment people's careers with a portfolio of, say, non-exec director roles. Um, and yet actually very little preparation <laughs> you know, for doing that, uh, very little structured preparation for doing that. So, Carolyn, I might come to you in a moment, actually, for thinking about how should, you know, anybody that's aspiring to become a non-exec director, what, what should be the prepar preparatory steps that they should be taking for their own professional development before they take on that responsibility, that, that serious responsibility um, that, that they would have on appointment. But before I do that, I just want to invite quickly our audience. Um, we thank you very much, by the way, for everybody joining us on LinkedIn Live um, today. Fantastic. We've got a really strong audience representing um, a whole number of countries around the world. Uh, we've got people from Brazil. So welcome if you're in Brazil today from Pakistan, from South Africa, from Cape Verde, from Algeria, from Zimbabwe and Washington over in the US. So fantastic uh, to have you all online and um, with us today. But please do, if you want to ask a question, put it directly to Carolyn and to Seamus. Just type your question in the chat and our colleagues will pick it up. And before you know it, we'll have it in front of them for them to be able to answer on your behalf. So don't be shy. Go ahead, jump right in and ask your question, please. So while you're thinking about that audience, Carolyn, I'm going to come to you and um, let's touch on that situation where I'm thinking I'd like to become a non-exec director, what should I be doing to prepare for that role? What is the kind of, you know, um, preparation steps that I should be taking? Mm, thank you, Nick. Um, very important. I think one of the things we don't realize about being on a board and governing is it's, it's not like managing. Um, you can't just you know, think that because you've managed a very large team or you've sat as a as a CEO of a very large organization, it's an easy transition into a board. How you know how bad can it be? But you have a completely different mindset when you're sitting as as a board board member in a, a member of a governing body. As a CEO of an organization, you really are a, a tribal leader. You're fighting for your organization, you're fighting for your space. You're fighting for your place in the sun. When you're in, at a board level, you're actually a, a legacy builder. You're not fighting anymore. You're building legacy. You're building sustainability. You're building a long-term solution. You're building. You're making decisions in the best interest of the whole organization, considering its stakeholders as well. So it's a very, very different mindset. And so for non-executive directors in particular, who don't have the background of being an, an executive director. So we've got multiple different board structures. You've got unitary board structures where you have both of those in a single board, or you've got um, a dual board structure, for example, um, where you have a management board and a supervisory board. So, but either of those boards, you have this concept of, of thinking of the long-term best interest of the company. So this legacy building. So going back to your question, Nick, um, what can you do? I think, first of all, understand the fundamentals, understand the basics, um, understand what it, what it means to govern and how that is different from managing. Because governance, although it's very linked and very closely tied to management, governance is not management. It's a different mindset 
and there's a different set of tools. So one of the, the discussions that we had in, in the ISO um, discussions you know, and, and um, negotiations in the development of the standard was really um, why can't you apply a management system standard kind of method, methodology to governance? Surely it's the same thing. You, you plan, you do, you check your work, and then you act on, on what, what you've done in the past. Isn't it the same? And although it might feel the same, it's actually very, very different. So I would recommend that at least any member of a governing body get a fundamental understanding of what is required when it comes to governing, not only the mindset, but also the tools that you need. All right, thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, it's a really clear path now that we're starting to chart from where we are currently, either as an existing you know, executive board member or as uh, an aspirational board member and to where we need to go. So we've got a great live question in from Armin Javed. And uh, Armin is actually asking, um, uh, could we highlight the differences? Now, given that we've only got a few minutes, we might, we're not, we might not be able to do all of them, but could we highlight some of the differences at least between ISO 37000 and the ISO 38500 um, standard? So, um, Carolyn, would you like to, you know, off the top of your head kind of, uh, think of a few of the differences for us. That would be great. Um, so they've chosen a fantastic example of ISO 38500. And ISO 38500 is the IT governance standard. Um, so in fact, it was the, one of the first governance standards that we had in ISO. So um, it trailblazing, um, but it is old now. And when it comes to governance, we've moved on and we've moved on from the evaluate, direct and monitor. In fact, in ISO 37000, we don't use the word control at all. Um, so yes, we mention internal controls, but um, a governing body actually controlling is uh, not something that, that a governing body can easily do. So we don't mention the word, word control, but going back to 38500, there was an initial governance model that was that was put in place and certainly 38500 was one and the series behind it were used to inform the building of 37000 now 37000 was published in 2021 and 38500 now is going through its review process so it is um, sitting at a committee draft stage at this at this point in its review and uh, they are asking for comments, which is happening through the ISO, very rigorous processes. So I can't comment on the changes that are being made to 38500, but it stands to reason that all the ISO governance standards will take from this overarching governance of organization standard that is now in place, which wasn't in place when 38500 was first drafted. So I think the, the differences really in the governance, um, the governance aspects, whereas IT is a subject matter in particular, um, you would expect something around the governance of um, finances, the governance of um, business continuity. You know, the, there's all the different subject matters in an organization that would need governance, but the governance framework now has been, or the model has been firmly established in 37,000. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Seamus, what would you like to add to that? Okay, well, so add to what Carolyn was saying and, and to go back to uh, a previous point you were making, Nick. If you want to serve on a board, there is no qualification you have to offer to go onto that board. Anybody can go onto a board, but you wouldn't allow, an, you wouldn't allow your accounts or your profit and loss and your balance sheet to be uh, run by anyone other than an accountant. You wouldn't take legal advice from anyone other than a lawyer. But despite that, anyone can join a board uh, without any qualification. And so what 37,000 is, is addressing is the fact that governance, corporate governance, is the overall umbrella governance, which every director ought to be able to understand and buy into in order to acquit themselves of their duties. 
And to go to another point that Carolyn was making, the directors are the custodians of the assets of the entity. They are there to create value, protect value, and preserve value. And that's what 37,000 is about, the creation, the protection, and the preservation of value. IT and all the other business disciplines fit into the overall uh, umbrella of governance. And the overall umbrella of governance is what 37,000 is about. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So I think it was a great question. So thank you very much indeed, Armand. Uh, we really appreciate you know you asking it on behalf of many other people, I'm sure, who are watching online and thinking along similar lines to you. So thank you for doing that. Um, now, Carolyn, I, I want to kind of focus in a little bit on um, what's special about ISO 37000 um, and ask you the question, can, can an organisation become certified as, as being compliant with ISO 37000? Um, so Seamus mentioned it a little bit earlier about um, that this is almost governance is kind of beyond compliance now. It certainly, it certainly needs compliance, but it's a step beyond that. Um, so, so compliance against a, a certifiable standard is not really where governance lives in the 21st century. Um, so certainly ISO is known for its management system standards and its um, certifications and compliance with standards. We think along the IT lines of ISO 27000 series, that's information security. With cybersecurity issues today, many people are turning to ISO 27000 and they're asking, are you ISO 27000 certified? Um, so that is a, a very reasonable question in a management system standard. But when it comes to governance, right. it's, it's a step beyond that. So how do you ask and how do you say I'm actually compliant with something that might not be appropriate for your organization. So what we're looking at in 37,000 is actually a guidance standard. So ISO makes standards. You can't really call it anything else. So we try it, you know, is it a report? Is it a code? Because those are different terms that are used across the world. Is it a regulation? It's not a regulation. ISO uses the term standard. There's a technical reports and technical specifications. But this is a standard. It's not a certifiable standard. In fact, it's a guidance standard. So you'll see in the name, in the formal name, it says ISO 37000-Guidance of Organization, uh, Governance of Organizations-Guidance. And I would, would have loved guidance to be upfront a guidance for the governance of organizations, but we follow the ISO rules. Um, so it is very much what's special, it's a guidance standard. So you can't have an organization that's certified to a guidance standard. But what you can do is you can have people certified that they understand this guidance standard. And that's what this training is all about, is certifying that somebody understands this guidance standard. And that's really what's special about um, ISO 37000, I think, from, a, uh, from that perspective. Maybe also the depth, what makes it special is, is the depth of participation and the approval that it got, the international consensus that it achieved. So there were 83 international liaison organizations involved in providing input into the standard that's beyond all the national all the country involvement so this isn't a this isn't something that was created by um, an audit firm or a con management consulting firm or a bunch of lawyers this was created by countries and elected representatives from countries so it's a whole lot of countries coming together to agree what governance agree first of all that there's a need for it and second of all, what it should look like. Now that's on the one side. So the 77 countries getting involved. On the other side is this 83 liaison organizations. Now that's really important. Going back to, it's not developed by a bunch of lawyers or it's not developed by a, you know, a specific profession because all of these 83 liaison organizations, they represent uh, investors. They've represented 
for example, one was the International Federation of Accountants. They very much had a say in, in the creation of the 37,000. So all of these stakeholders have had an input, the um, consumers, the consumer bodies, the investors, the accountants, the lawyers, the um, auditors, they have all uh, the um, Internal Audit Association, for example, the Institute of Internal Auditors was involved. So all of these liaison organizations have gone in beyond just the countries in crafting the standard. And it had a 100% international agreement when it was published as a final draft. So pretty much Fantastic. unheard of. Yeah, I was, I was going to say it's one thing, you know, arriving at um, consensus with half a dozen. <laughs> it's quite another arriving at it with more than 70 countries and more than 80, you know, um, uh, bodies as well. So very well done um, indeed. Some some great stewardship there uh, along the way, I'm quite sure, as those terms were defined and talked over and the spirit of getting a global governance framework in place was uh, made its way all of the way through to the ultimately to the to the final wording of the standard itself. So, um, Chemis, you've been involved with governance for a long time yourself as well, and as a member of the Chartered Governance Institute, you must have experienced a, a broad range of different kinds of interventions to try and lift people up and improve governance. Um, how does this offering compare to the past and how does ISO 37000 really change the game, I suppose? Okay, well, I've been traveling around the world extensively working with boards and directors in countries in all regions of the world. And that's actually what my book is about, about what I've learned from that. And that is one of the reasons why I don't like to talk about best practice, because as I say, from one jurisdiction to another, from one organisation to another, whether it's for profit, not for profit, uh, public sector, the business models all differ. And what we find with, for example, the Chartered Governance Institute qualification is that it's, it's often quite jurisdiction specific. So the most influential code in the world is the UK Corporate Governance Code. It's the 30th anniversary of the UK Corporate Governance Code this year. South Africa has also been amazing with the King reports uh, in terms of the development of governance thinking. But to some degree, they represent local or regional or jurisdictional approaches to the governance and, and reflecting and respecting their governance cultures. Whereas what Carolyn has explained is that the 37,000 approach is even more so an umbrella approach, which with common terms and common understandings and common interpretations agreed by all these uh, important stakeholders means that we can speak a common language. And actually, one can't speak a common language if one is just following one's local governance code. Um, one, has to make, uh, one has to make allowances for different organizations in other jurisdictions. And that's what 37,000 does. It overcomes that problem. And that's why it's actually not evolutionary, but transformational. It, it's just given us a completely new approach to the way in which we can have that governance conversation around the world. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed. And that you know, gives us uh, clarity, I think, on you know, the added value of taking this approach over something um, locally. I think it's important to always think above and beyond you know, the current requirement. We see this a lot when we're working with organisations who are trying to you know, uh, team up together to deliver, uh, for example, public-private partnerships, major infrastructure projects, um, uh, service-led initiatives around the world where you're holding hands you know all the way around the planet and needing a common language needing a common way of working to common standards and so on now on standards um uh dr danny hart has asked a live question for us it's another comparative question so carolina <laughs> i'll ask you to have a little <laughs> thing about this um if you can now we're, we're not a walking talking uh, lexicon of standards here but we'll do our best for you uh dr danny so this question is really about the key differences between 37,000 and another ISO standard, 31,000. So now then, 
I, I feel a little bit like a quiz master at the moment, Carolyn. So I apologise for that. But it's a genuine question. So uh, any thoughts on that for Dr. Danny? Absolutely. Um, 31,000 is a fantastic standard. It is also going through a revision. In fact, there's a, a big uh, ISO initiative around the whole uh, question and body of knowledge of risk. So 31,000 was a key in informing the approach to risk governance in, in the standard in 37,000. So we use the same definitions that 31,000 has uh, the definition of risk, the definitions of, of the various aspects associated with risk. Um, that's all included in 37,000. One of the principles in 37,000 is that of risk governance. And if I can um, maybe just add some insight for, for Danny, um, the risk governance principle actually goes a bit beyond um, the risk management aspect. So we had we had the found, the, the experts from TC232 uh, is the um, risk uh, technical committee. We had them involved and we had the experts involved and country experts, risk experts involved in the development and design of this specific principle. And really it talks to, yes, as you can expect, the board and the governing body is um, needs to oversee the organization's risk management and risk approach. But more than that, the governing body itself needs to practice good risk management. When it's making decisions, it needs to understand the, and can I say it, risks and opportunities that go with the, yeah, that yeah. decision. So um, it actually takes 31,000 a step forward. Um, in terms of the governance um, aspects, as opposed to risk management per se. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, Dr. Danny, thank you so much for, for asking that question, raising that question. Um, again, on behalf of um, a large number of people, I think, who would have been thinking along similar lines there today. So thank you for that. Um, so let's um, just kind of start to um, wrap up a little bit. I've got one more question that I'd like to put to you, Seamus, if I may, which is really kind of thinking about, all right, so we we get it now. All right, here's this international standard. It's going to help us lift up our, you know, the way in which we're delivering governance to our organisations, no matter which industry sector, whether we're public or private sector, gives us an opportunity to learn and to think differently about what we're doing. Um, but beyond that, then, once we've gone on the course, once we've taken the course, what are the, what are the kind of, what's the call to action that you would have for a board member who's taking these this kind of training and this qualification, what would you like to see them do afterwards? Well, um, as I said before, 37,000 is transformational. Uh, it, it, it changes things and governance also changes things. It changes our understanding of the world and the world changes every day and we need to move on every day. And what I would want an individual director to do would be to actually say to her or his colleagues, we all ought to have this uh, certification. We all ought to have this accreditation. Because if one is to attempt to educate the whole board with one of the other qualifications on the market, that's a, a time consuming and expensive and resource intensive activity. And that is why most boards and their members do not pursue a common director qualification because of cost and time and everything. Whereas what we have here is the ability to uh, allow all the, the directors of the board to access the training uh, in a very democratic, user-friendly, self-paced way. Um, and I think the race will be to the top. The race is going to be for the board to can prove that all of their members uh, uh, have understood the standard and are bringing the thinking to, to, to bear in the decision making that is going on inside the boardroom. Because governance is all about decision making. It's about judgments, it's about decision making on all of these areas of cyber, risk, strategy, compliance, ethics, and so on. And 37,000 provides that understanding of that wider terrain 
And I would expect stakeholders to be looking for assurance that the board of the organization they are dealing with is suitably qualified and is playing at that level. Reassurance is not enough. We're talking about assurance. And assurance will be evidenced by the fact that not just one, but all the directors on the board and the board secretary and other governance professionals in the organization have uh, pursued the training and, and have achieved the accreditation. Understand. Thank you very much indeed. We do have one more live question that we're just going to sneak in um, if we can. It's from a gentleman called uh, Jan van Bon. And his question really is about, you know, in the past, I think the legacy of some of these standards has been almost to almost to end up with a kind of a tick box, you know, type approach, you know, where a, an auditor is looking for, you know, evidence, but it's perfunctory. And so organisations kind of say, yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to get into this, but it doesn't change behaviours. Carolyn, what, what's your you're right at the heart of the getting the vision for this into reality and we thank you for that what what do you see as the ways in which 37000 is avoiding that tick box mentality such a good question um this really talks to the heart of governance so thank you for the question um two parts one is um south africa's king code uh, king report um, really is trailblazing in that it's recognized this problem of a, a tick box you know, um, as it's not uh, legislation, it's not regulation. So it's not, you know, you, so you've got an ethics policy and you've got this and you've got this and you've got this tick, 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 tick. Okay, we're all good. We've seen organizations, very, very large organizations fail with all their their tick boxes checked, right? It, it, it's not good enough. And I think Jan's question goes to exactly that, is it's not good enough just to tick the box. So um, going back to the King reports, the latest King report that was actually now published in 2016, so quite old in thinking, um, although very relevant still today, um, talks about, and this is innovative when it comes to governance, talks about the need for governance outcomes. So if you're going to look at whether an organization is well governed. You don't look at whether they have an ethics policy and they have this policy and they have that framework, et cetera. You look at whether it's achieving its governance outcomes. And in ISO 37000, we have three specific governance outcomes. We've followed that, that approach that was really uh, initiated in the King reports in South Africa and internationally that has completely been embraced. And there are three governance outcomes that we believe will um, be the benefits of organizations and where you can look at organizations to tell whether they are well governed. And the one is that they are stewarding their resources and the world's resources appropriately. So it's good resource stewardship is what you're looking for. The other one is ethical behavior. Is it not only is the governing body itself behaving ethically and making ethical decisions, but the organization, people in the organization are behaving ethically as well as the organization in society and, and the King reports call, call that corporate citizenship, is that the organization is behaving ethically in society. So that ethical behavior is the second governance outcome. And then of course, the one that we all look to is effective performance, that you're meeting your targets, that you're realizing your objectives and all of those kinds of good things. So that's the normal one. And the two other governance outcomes that are specifically governance focused is that ethics behavior, that ethical behavior, as well as the um, as the responsible stewardship. So that's in the in the code itself. But how else do we make sure that it's not a tick, tick, tick kind of exercise? And that's in and this is a very new standard. It's hot off the press, so to speak. So this is September 2021. Everybody's in the throes of pandemic. Everybody's busy with all sorts of other things. So it really has come in under the radar. But as you can see from today, it is it is world changing. And, and Seamus said it so well. This is transformational. Um, it has come in under the radar. So you that's why not many people have picked it up as yet. And thank you for this live event. Um, but in terms of transformational and making sure we don't tick the box on this, is we're busy developing an ISO um, assessment methods that go with it. So how do you assess whether you are, are applying this standard correctly? And there's two bodies of, of work. 
that's going on at the moment. One is in the development of indicators, so an ind indicators of good governance, and the other one is a maturity model. Um, so the maturity model uh, works kind of on the basis of um, levels of maturity. So it, and it's not only you know that you've got this kind of policy and that kind of framework, but it's are you behaving in the correct way? What is your attitude? towards governance. So it brings in those aspects as well. And it also goes, in, uh, talks a little bit about, um, you know, the, the documentation around it. Is it suitable to have a, you know, a 50 page governance framework document where there are only, only 50 people in the organization? <laughs> um, maybe right. that's not appropriate, really, that maybe is a waste of, of, of uh, resources, governance, uh, you know, your organization's resources. So, um, so looking at those two aspects, the one is making sure that it's outcomes focused, it's governance outcomes focused, and the other is making sure that we have assessment standards um, around it and supporting it. Now those assessment standards are in development, they're still at committee draft level, they're not um, published as yet, but they are expected to be published towards the end of next year and early 2024. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Carolyn, for most informative and uh, uh, comprehensive um, answer uh, to that. Also signposting a little bit, folks, that, um, you know, what's kind of coming next and how you can get involved um, right at the ground floor of this. So let's move then to just some brief closing remarks, um, if we may. Um, uh, Seamus, let me come to you first and we'll give Carolyn, Carolyn Carolyn, a little rest for a moment, and then we'll come back to her it's okay, um, Nick, momentarily. Okay, Nick, <laughs> That's that's all right. Don't worry at all. So, um, Seamus, then closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the chance to take part in this great conversation. The world is changing, and governance needs to change with the changing world, and we need to equip boards for the future. The old codes, the old ways of thinking, we will have to leave some of that behind. And what 37,000 represents is the new wave of thinking. It's what stakeholders are going to be expecting of boards and organisations. And that's why we need to push it and promote it and, and be part of it ourselves. Thank you very much indeed. Carolyn? Thanks, Nick. Um, this has been internationally agreed. It is an international standard. Um, I am very worried when people read, when you Google governance, you get honestly the biggest load of rubbish out there. So you have to be very circumspect when you're looking at governance. It, you know, it's not state, state governance. This is a governance of organizations. And here you, your investment in buying the standard, in having training on the standard really is well-founded because this has been internationally agreed. It's had all the right parties involved and it, it is, um, you know, it's, you can be assured of your investment that you make in time, in money, in, in application. So it's, um, that's what I, that's why I think it's, you know, you get a, a lot of rubbish out there today. This is not that, this is, is the dinkum. This is the real thing as, as Chamber said, the gold standard. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you very much um, indeed to both of you for sharing such, you know, um, your passion, first of all, uh, for driving up uh, the, um, the quality and the execution around, uh, around governance worldwide. Really appreciate that. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, and also for sharing that insight with all of us um, today and for the tireless work that you continue to do in helping to build better boards around the world. Now, if you're watching and you'd like to find out more, there is a self-paced online course now available. So just point your phone at the QR code on the screen right now, and it's gonna take you over to the Fluid Rock website, um, which is a training organization. And you can then sign up if you wish, read some more about it and join in and learn with colleagues from all over the world as you begin to embrace the world of ISO 37000. I'm sure that you, like me, have been inspired by you know, the incredible words uh, of both Carolyn and Seamus today. So please do leave a comment down below um, in the chat and help us spread the word by liking and sharing the video. LinkedIn is full of stuff which is good to share. And occasionally you find something which is great to share. And this is one of those moments. Nobody will, you know, un unfriend you. <laughs> 
for sharing this. For sure, it's going to help so many people. So look, thank you very much, everybody. It's been absolutely brilliant. We'll see you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nick.